Is it on? Everybody, let's get started. We need, hey everybody. Hey, let's get started. We're on a time schedule with the other group coming in behind us. Peggy, where are you? You got any announcements? Listen up, everybody. Come on, we need to get, we need to get going because we're, we're on a time crunch here. Uh, the, Sunday class did four the, Sunday the Sunday school class did four backpacks out of our money, just so you all know, out of our account. So. And the baskets, are here. baskets are here. Anytime you want to throw in a buck or two. Uh, anything else? Mel's not here? All right. Uh, got some prayer requests. Some of these are left over, uh, <clears throat> and some are new. Uh, the, the police, of course, and our country. Uh, you know anything on Joe and Susan? Any update? They're, they're well, but they're just still kind of recuperating. Okay, well, good, good. Uh, the president, unbelievers, of course. I don't know. Anybody know anything new on uh, the, the uh, Mason and Leslie? Leilani's bunch. Okay, they're good. All right, good. Good. Deborah Swisher, she's a co-worker, Dick, or work. Okay, she's battling cancer. Mm. Uh, Thomas wanted to leave Julia Pearson up here. Anything new on the Simonises? Okay. Doing well. And uh, Gary Wallace is here in the place. I thought I saw him back here. We got Gary up here too. Somewhere. There he is. Uh, the Fry Girls left them up here. Uh, Brandon and Tim Tom are friends of ours from high school. They both have COVID. Okay. And So all these, uh, they've all got COVID. Continue to play, pray for Caitlin uh, Van Bieber. Uh, David, we got, you're still up here. I, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And Miss Ethel, got her up here. Ann Long. Uh, what'd you? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Miss Schulte, and then Joyce Childress. That's your mom. She's still struggling with. Yeah. Weston Johnson is the one Taryn sent out this week. Uh, she's Lisa Littleton's, or he's Lisa Littleton's nephew. Billy Mills. Uh, the the cat. You know there was a prayer request went out for Miss Catch this week too. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, local leaders, people without work, Israel, Peggy, we still got you up there. Uh, the Davis family, that was another prayer request that uh, Terrence sent out this week. Uh, I think everybody in that family was sick. And, of course, we'll continue to pray for Gary. Yes. Oh, yeah, the, uh, what's the backpack thing. What else, Mr. Stokes? Uh, close friend Ann Davis passed away last night. Aunt's mom. Uh, oh, Mont's mama. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't say more about Ann. She uh, lost her wife's relationship. She said she died here. Caitlin Baker, Miss Ann kept her in the nursery. Wow.
right? Income tax, finances, spiritual matters. We, we a lot of times call it the mayor of Ringo. <laughs> mayor of Ringo, that's good. I like that. I like that. And today you'll see a lot of award, reward. Amen to that. Yeah, she's doing better than we are. What else? Anything else? No, I haven't. Cal, have you heard anything on Sandy? Yeah. Okay. Nothing else? Mark, can I pick on you this morning and ask you to open us in prayer? Amen. Thank you, Mark. Uh, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts 17. We're continuing our journey through Acts, a little over halfway. At this point, Paul and Silas are on Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, last week, we saw both those guys got thrown in jail. Uh, in Philippi, and uh, we saw that the, we, we sort of peeled that apart and saw that the whole point of them going to jail, and the earthquake and all that was all for one reason, and that was just to reach that Philippian jailer, I believe, uh, for his salvation. And uh, <clears throat> so they got released, you remember, at the end of, cha- of chapter uh, 16, and that's where we pick, up this, pick them up this morning going into to Acts uh, chapter 17. Read with me at uh, at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Uh, You got my map? Uh, I'll spring that on y'all. We'll sort of get our bearings. Uh, You see up sort of up there almost in the top left corner, you see Philippi and you see Amphipolis. There to the left, uh, Apollonia, and then Thessalonica. That map is, I've noticed the, at home that it's kind of messed up there. But anyway, Thessalonica, you see there in the corner, that's, that's, uh, that's where they are uh, right now. Um, they left Philippi, and they were likely traveling uh, what was known as the Via Ignatia. Uh, you and I might consider that an early version of an interstate that the, that the Romans built. Up here, you see the Black Sea and then the, uh, uh, oh shoot, what's the other sea? The Adriatic Sea is kind of off our map. And they built right about where Bithynia is in the middle there. They built a, a, what I would consider a, an early version of the interstate and it connected the Black Sea to the, to the Adriatic Sea. It went all, and that's probably... Uh, that's likely uh, the route that they were taking, and they traveled through and stopped at Amphipolis and Apollonia, and it appears they didn't stay there very long because we're not told uh, anything that happened there. Some say they didn't, maybe didn't even stop there at all uh, and spend any time, and that likely could be true because that was really Paul's typical M.O. Uh, he never spent much time in the small cities, uh, he, he would uh, typically concentrate on the larger cities. His strategy was reach the big cities, get with, with the gospel, and then that will filter down to the little cities, you know. 
uh, back, back to the little ones. And you needn't wonder if that was a very effective strategy because in about 10 years, only 10 years, Paul established churches in four different provinces uh, uh, in, in Rome, Galatia, Macedonia, Acacia, and Asia, only in about, all in about 10 years. That's phenomenal by today's missionary standards, really. Uh, so it was a very effective uh, strategy. Uh, so they went from Apollonia, or Amphipolis, Apollonia, to the city of Thessalonica. And actually, the city of Thess- Thessalonica is still a vibrant city today uh, over in Greece. It's spelled differently. It's really pronounced, I think, Thessalonike, uh, which use, they use a K, not a C. But it was a, even back then, it was an important port city, capital of Macedonia. That's about 100 miles or a three-day walk from... Uh, oh, that's awesome. I've been... Oh, yeah. Well, no, it won't. It won't pick up on that screen. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for the try. Uh, about a, it, Thessalonica is about 100 miles, about a three-day walk uh, from Philippi where they just left. Verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Now, the biggest thing that jumps out to me uh, about those verses right there is the word reasoned there in verse 3. It says, for three Sabbath days he reasoned with them. Uh, And actually, there's two important words there. You got reasoned and explained. For three Sabbath days he reasoned with them, explaining and demonstrating uh, that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. The Greek word there translated for reason is where we get our root word uh, for, for our English word dialogue. So in other words, they had, they had di- they, it was exchange, an exchange, questions, answers, a dialogue. Can I just point out to you, it was a dialogue, not an argument, okay? I, I, he dialogued from the scriptures and, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, contrary to what you might think, very few times in the New Testament did people like the Apostle Paul and the other followers uh, and the disciples, apostles uh, of Jesus, very few times did they really get into a debate and argue with folks. I think we feel like they did it a lot, and they, they really didn't if you, if you take time to search the Scripture. They did occasionally get in debates, uh, but not as much as you might think. They, now, they argued and debated with Jesus a lot. And they opposed the apostles oftentimes, but rarely did they get in these verbal boxing matches trying to match biblical wits with somebody. When, when the mob, uh, Mr. Stokes mentioned the mob mentality last week, uh, when the mob typically opposed them, what did they do? They would shake the, go ahead, I'll cut somebody off. Yeah, they just left. They just shook the dust off their shoes as a symbol, and they just left left town. And the reason I point this out is I think this sometimes keeps us from trying to talk to folks about Jesus, have a gospel conversation, because we start thinking, oh, what if they start a debate with me? I I don't know my Bible well enough, and I I can't think on my feet fast enough to get in a debate with somebody. Well, don't worry about it. Don't get in a debate with somebody. If somebody, if you want to have a gospel conversation with, about Jesus, and somebody wants to get in a debate with you, just tell them to talk to the hand, you know, and just walk away. This, the life's too short to waste on people like that, in my opinion. Uh, if they're going, if they're, I, so uh, that, that, I just want to point that out. I want that. I hope that liberates somebody in here. That I, sometimes I think that prevents us. Uh, from talking to other folks about the Lord because we're afraid we're going to have to get in, you know, start quoting Scripture right out of the top of our head like Brother Cal does up here. I can't, I can't do that. He's a master at it. But uh, God, didn't argue, God didn't argue you into coming to him, did he? He, he reasoned with you. And that's, 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 all, that's all we're called to do is reason with people uh, about Scripture. And I, my, one of my favorite verses, Isaiah 118, Come now, this is the Lord talking. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. 
Though your sins are like scarlet, though they be white, they, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I mean, there, nowhere in Scripture did anybody get argued into submission to Jesus. It's just not in there. And then again, the, the, the other word I mentioned there that, that we have is the word uh, explained. Uh, it says they were explaining and demonstrating. Uh, that, that Greek word for explained literally means opening. Uh, he, Paul and Silas opened the word, opened scriptures to them that, that, and explained what it meant. And this is exactly, if you remember, this is exactly what Jesus did with the couple on the road to Emmaus, right? They were walking along. They didn't know who he was. And it said he started with Moses and went through all the scriptures. Uh, it's Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He opened. He explained uh, what the Bible had to say about him. And uh, this is an important point, I think, too, because Christianity is not an exercise in the abstract. I mean, Paul reasoned with them. He logically explained the Bible to them. Despite what the world thinks about us, we don't have a blind faith. We don't walk in here and check our brain. We don't leave our brains at home when we come to worship Jesus uh, at church. Our faith is very sound. It's logical. It's rational, it's reasonable, it makes, it makes sense. And uh, hopefully, what Paul's doing here is, it's my intent anyway, hopefully that's what we do in here. We just, uh, we, 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 take the, we take the scripture and try to explain what it all means. What I do in here is, is they, they call expository teaching. I take, I take a book, I open it up, and I start at verse 1, and I go verse by verse, word by word, and try to unravel it, peel the onion back, uh, and, and see what it means. Not a shred of doubt in my mind that that's what God has called me to do, is to teach expositionally uh, through, through Scripture. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I love our pastor. You know, Brother Cal does expository preaching. That's what he's doing right now, verse by verse. Out of the book of Ephesians, right? You know, he, he, he spent, what, a whole sermon on two verses this morning. But that, that's expository preaching. Uh, that's, it's, I, I'll take, I personally like expository preaching and teaching more than I like topical. Now, I didn't say topical preaching was wrong or bad. In fact, Mike and I were having a discussion about this this morning. Uh, but I just, I believe the majority of preaching and teaching uh, in the church needs to be uh, expositional. You know, going through, there's just, and there's precious little of it uh, in, in the church today. And you say, well, what's so, what's so special about expository preaching and teaching? Well, I'll tell you what's special about it. Look down there at verse 6. It says, the, it, we're going to see here in a minute, it says, these guys have turned the world upside down. Well, they turned the world upside down with their expository preaching and teaching. They, they weren't. Not, it wasn't. A, they didn't turn the world upside down by talking about the hot topic of the day. They 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 did it by opening the Bible and explaining uh, what it meant. And uh, you know, when Brother Cal or whoever or even myself in teaching, if you preach and teach expositionally, there's no chance that you're going to preach with an agenda, is there? Because you're just t coming out right out of the Bible, whatever it says. So, and there's, and there's also no chance of dodging the hard things that we find in Scripture. If you take them as they come, you got, you got to deal. You, you can't run and you can't hide uh, when you're doing things expositionally. Ugh, hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I heard uh, J. Vernon McGee say one time he preached a sermon, and a woman, uh, a lady, come up to him afterwards. Who's been talking to you about me? Because he thought he was like nobody, you know. But uh, now you need 
you need topical preaching. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not poo-pooing that. I'm just, I'm just trying to drive home what these guys were, were, were doing here. Now, we know from verse 1, they went to the synagogue. That's what they always did when they came to a new town. You know that. Lots of synagogues in this area at this time because by now, Caesar had run all of the Jews out of Rome. He had expelled them all. So they went out into the countryside, and there's, uh, there's Jews everywhere, and they were uh, uh, establishing um, uh, synagogues. So there, you, you found there was a lot of, lot of synagogues in, in this uh, area during this time. And it says he reasoned with them in Thessalonica for three Sabbath days. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean three weeks. You got three Sabbath days, but you got a week before the first one, and you got a week after the third one. And so he was likely there. And then we, and we, from other passages in Philippians and, and in the, the first and second Thessalonians, it, he probably spent a month or more uh, in, in Thessalonica. So don't get in your head three Sabbaths, not necessarily just three weeks. And notice what he's, you know, we keep talking about that he was reasoning with them, but notice what they were reasoning with him about. For three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. This, this explaining that Christ had to suffer and rise again uh, this was always a subject that the Jews struggled with. They could not f- understand this. They knew the word of God was infallible and right, but they would read passages like Isaiah 53 that talks about the suffering Messiah. But then they turned around and they saw passages like Psalm chapter 2 uh, that said, talked about the ruling, reigning Messiah. And so this was always a difficult thing for them to understand. Still is for some of them uh, today. How can, a, how can the Messiah be a suffering servant, but at the same time be a ruling king? This was a difficult thing for them to try to, it just didn't make sense. And, uh, but so they, they, they thought about it over the, you know, over the centuries, and they finally said, well, we got it. The, re- the way that works is there can't be one Messiah, there must be two of them. That's the way they reconciled uh, this in their mind. And so they came, the, some of the leading rabbis, they, they called the reigning Messiah that was going to come, they called him Messiah ben David, meaning son of David. And they called the suffering Messiah that you find in Isaiah 53, they called him Messiah ben Joseph, because you remember Joseph suffered uh, at the hands of his, of his own brothers. And so... That's what they thought. That was the only thing that made sense to them, how their Messiah, how Scripture talked about him suffering, yet ruling and reigning. Well, then Paul comes along, a guy who used to think the exact same thing as they did. He says, I got great, here he's he's telling them, I got great news for y'all. It's not two Messiahs. It is one Messiah, and I'm going to show you from the Bible, uh, it's scripture, Old Testament. I'm going to show you from the Bible how that can be. And so he opened it, reasoned with them, and explained it, that, that both sets of prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. He explained that Jesus, son of Joseph, you know, suffered, uh, was the suffering Messiah, but three days later he rose as Jesus, the son of David, the, reign, the ruling reigning king, and, and that he's coming back. Does that make sense? Or did I make that more complicated than it needed to be? <laughs> but they did. I mean, they, they, they just, how, how can he be, how can he suffer and, and then be, you know, kick the Romans' butts? I, they, they couldn't figure all that out. But anyway, Paul comes along and to, to, to make them understand that. Verse 4. And some of them were, persu- were persuaded, and a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Now, uh, this, yes, they're in a Jewish synagogue, but remember that during this time there, were, there was not a Jewish, Jews-only crowd. You had those Gentile believers. Uh, they weren't full-blooded Jews, but they believed in the God of, the, uh, of Israel. And those, they were the God-fearers we've mentioned in here so many times. So you got Jews, you got Greeks. And it says here, not a few leading women, meaning lots of leading women, uh, responding to Paul's message. 
But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some, uh, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring, him out, uh, bring them out to the people. <laughs> I, I, I agree with a guy named Skip Heitzig. I watched, him, uh, watched a video of him on this verse. The New King James calls these guys evil men. The NIV calls them bad characters. The New Living Translation calls them troublemakers. But I love the King James. It says it calls them lewd fellows of a baser sort. Don't you love the polite King's English sometimes? Lewd, certain lewd fellows of a baser sort. I used to run around with some guys that were lewd fellows. I was one of them. Might still be. I just thought that was really funny. Certain lewd fellows of a baser sort. Uh, but notice it doesn't say these guys that they didn't believe. It just says they were, this is just old-fashioned jealousy uh, here and envy. You know, when Paul was per persecuting the church, he at least sincerely thought he was right, and he sincerely thought the Christians were wrong. He was sincerely wrong, but at least he thought he was coming from a, a place of some sort of moral high ground. Not these guys. These guys, this is old-fashioned, just envy and jealousy here. That's, that's much worse, in my, in my opinion. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering them up, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find him, they drug Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. So you ask, well, who is Jason? Well, we don't really know. Uh, <laughs> some think he's the guy Paul mentions over in Romans 16, 21, uh, some believe he was just a wealthy believer uh, who had offered his home as a gathering place uh, for the church. Uh, I think I read somewhere that some think he was a relative of Paul's. Craig, did you, you find anything else on, you know anything else on Jason? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, we, we're just not told. Uh, now, some of your translations say these men have caused trouble all over the world. I'm not sure what that statement means. It just could mean that the news about these Christians, Paul and his missionaries, were news of that was just sort of circling the country. You know, the news was out on them and that, the, that everybody was sort of finding out about him. Or it could just be these guys, you know, hyperbole, just uh, over-exaggerating. Uh, I, I tend to think, the, the word was just out in the country. You know, people, whether Paul had been to your town or not, people were hearing about Paul and this radical new sect uh, uh, of Judaism called, called Christians. Um, It could have been. I, I, I thought of the comparison, too, when I was looking at this, of, how, of today. When you don't get your way, you just start a riot. I mean, that, that seems the way, the way of the world, is it not, today? If you don't, if you don't ha like what's happening, start a riot. Get some people whipped up in a frenzy. Uh, that, I, that's, I, see a lot of, I, I see a lot of similarities to that in here, so you may be right. Yeah. He did. There's a there's a verse. Is it in? Is it in Thess Thessalonians? There's a verse that talk. Paul said the, the church at Philippi had been bank bankrolling, helping bankrolls. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, 
a good a good thing to do as you're going through this. I did this this week. I went back and read First and Second Thessalonians. And it's a good thing to do. It's a good way to study Acts, you know. And then when you when we were you know in Philippi was a good time to read the letter to the Philippians because you get a you get a better idea of what was going on, you know, what was happening. So uh, it's a good point, Craig. Now I like. The, new, the King James and the New King James better here because it says these have turned the world upside down. They're trying, they're trying to insult these guys and they just paid the highest compliment you can possibly pay a Christian ministry, uh, a missionary, did they not? I mean, how great would it be if someone said about us, those dang people down there at Second Mile have turned Clarksville upside down. I'd love to say guilty is charged on that, wouldn't you? I mean, uh, <clears throat> but they didn't turn the world upside down. Satan has turned the world upside down. They're trying to turn the world right side up. Is, is it not? I mean, isn't the world upside down today? We're calling evil good, good evil. Isaiah uh, 520, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The world is living upside down, topsy-turvy, and it's really, if you think about it, it's the mission of the church to turn the world right side, right side up uh, so that man can, can have a, a, a relationship with God. Y'all are quiet today. I'm not giving you much time to talk, I guess, either, though. Uh, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Those charges sound familiar to you? It's a lot like the, basically the same charges they, they levied against Jesus, was it not? Uh, Luke 23, 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar, which was a lie, and claims to be Messiah, a king. The, basically, the charges against Paul and Silas here from this crowd uh, is treason. Uh, and, it's, and it's very similar uh, to what they, they accused Jesus of. You remember back in this day, everyone was required to say, Caesar is Lord. History books tell us six million Christians were murdered uh, from those first two and a half centuries for refusing to say Caesar is Lord. Six million. Dude, that's a lot of people. And when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. They released Jason and the other people and they made them pay a security deposit, basically guaranteeing that there wouldn't be any other rights in town. And uh, Yes. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm not enough. I've got to be honest with you. Here lately, I don't watch the news no more. I just can't handle it. I, I don't want to get on my soapbox, you know, but I, I, I can't, I'm conservative. I'm nine times I, I'm, I'm conservative. But I am so sick of not being able to turn on the news and get one extreme or the other. I'm sick of both extremes. I want somebody to just let me think for myself for a change. And because they can't and won't, I, we turned it off. Well, you know, I, and I'm going to sound real pious to you right here. And I don't mean to because I'm not a good little church boy. But what we started doing uh, is we listen to sermons. Uh, I put on Adrian Rogers. And I, I, got to, I, be, I get to work and I'm like, man, I'm in a better mood than I, than I typically am from watching the news. I went off on your question there. I, I don't know if that's what China's do. That may be what they're, they're doing, requiring. But Rome didn't give two hoots about what you believe. They didn't care what your religion was. All they cared about is that you remain peaceful. That's all Rome was concerned with. Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And anybody that interrupted that peace, they dealt with it one way and one way only. Swift, brutal action. You get out of line in Rome, they would squash you like a bug. That's why they ruled for so long. They didn't play. 
Then we come to the second city uh, that Paul went to in this chapter, uh, verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night uh, to Berea. They smuggled them out of town uh, uh, in the darkness of night because this mob had been stirred up against them. And they had, so when they arrived in Berea, uh, they went in, into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Notice two things made the Bereans more noble, as it says here, than the others. They received the word of truth with readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to see if what, uh, what Paul was saying was true. I love verse 11. Verse 11 is the verse that tells you, don't you believe anything that comes out of Billy Walker's mouth, or Cal Hampton's mouth, for that matter. Uh, that, that's it. They received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Uh, the NIV says they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. It's my responsibility to stand before you on Sunday mornings and rightly divide the word of God. I'll have to answer to God for how I handle that. But it's your responsibility to check out what I say. And make sure that I'm telling you the truth. Read the Bible yourself. Check me out. I'm terrified of teaching something wrong anyway. I welcome it. I welcome it. The Bereans are listening to probably the, well, no, no, probably to it. They're listening to the greatest Bible teacher that ever lived that was not named Jesus. But yet every day they would go home and check out and make sure that what he was saying was the truth. They didn't just accept Paul's teaching. They checked it out for themselves. And did you notice how often they, they, they checked him out? Once every fifth, for, for about 15 minutes before uh, church on Sundays, right? Daily, daily. How does the world view the Bible today? What do they think of it? Do what? Inconsequential. Old fashioned. Fairy tales, yeah. These Bereans, to them, it wasn't just a book of poetry or mystery or inspirational thoughts for the day. This was the book of truth. And it isn't just the world that needs the Bible. The church needs the Bible too. You know, I listen to lots and lots of sermons. I really do from lots and lots of different preachers. And I'm amazed at some of the, the messages that I hear and the titles that I... They, let me give you some titles for messages. These came from a popular preacher today. It ain't Joel Osteen. I know y'all, I beat up on him all the time. This is not Joel Osteen. But he is a preacher. I'll bet you something, most of y'all got books uh, of his in your house. In your house, uh, here's some of the sermon titles. Escaping the people pleaser trap. How to keep from stressing out. Fighting for an awesome marriage. Fighting for an awesome family. To me, those are not sermons. Those are lectures. You know? Uh, we got too many lectures. We need some. We don't have enough Bible teaching going on. Sermons on the Bible. This is why when people... They don't reach for the Bible first anymore. They come to you and they want to say, hey, what's a good book? Uh, my marriage is in trouble. What's a good book for that? Or my relationship with my kids are in trouble. What's, what's a good book I should read on that? Well, how about the Bible? That's where we need to be. It's a novel concept. But it ain't flashy. It's not sexy. It doesn't sell. I read a great quote one time. It said, there's lots of money to be made in religion, but not so much in Christianity. A lot of truth in that, I, I believe. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. 
Those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So this is deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra would say. And if you're keeping score, this is the fifth city Paul has been run out of by an angry mob. Why would they come all the way from Thessalonica to run Paul out of Berea? Why would they do that? Why would they care? He's, you know, you got him out of, he's out of my town. Why go all the way to Berea to, to run him out of there too? Do what? Yeah, I think it's like we said the other day. This is proof to me Jesus is real. The links that people will go to to, 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 to stamp it out proves to me that it's real. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did. They did. Uh, the, it's not so much the, the Berea, but I was talking about reading Thessal the Thessalonians. If you read First and First and Second Thessalonians, you get a sense Paul was worried to death because he he didn't get to stay there very long, and. and before they ran him out of town, he was worried to death that Satan was going to come in and just destroy the church, you know. And, and he sent Timothy back to check on him. And Timothy came back and said, hey, man, they're rocking and rolling there. They're doing great. You get, you, you, you get a sense of that uh, of Paul's letter on First and Second Thessalonians. And obviously, Paul is the main object of persecution here. It wasn't, you know, Silas and Timothy, they, they didn't leave town. It was just Paul. But here, and I'm going, and I'm going to stop right here. But please notice the main character of these stories here is the Word of God. It really is. It's central. To, Paul and his companions turned the world upside down by using the Word of God. That's how they did it. And if Clarksville's ever going, or if Second Mile's ever going to turn Clarksville upside down for the, uh, for the Lord, it will be with the Word of God. We'll have to do it the same way. There's only, that's the only way you can do it. I feel like I blew through that really fast. But anyway, any questions or comments? I apologize if I did. Well, oh, yes. I knew there was somebody. I knew there was somebody I was forgetting this morning prayer request. Do y'all know this is personal? My dad, in, in about two weeks, will have been dead for f five months, and we still don't have him in the ground. He's still laying over on Madison Street. That's unbelievable. I. You can get it that you can't do a, they won't let you have a color guard. And, you know, they're, the rest of the family really wants dad to have a full-blown military funeral. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to it, but I think it's time to move on. But anyway, that, you're getting into my personal, I'm, I'm airing my personal laundry with you. I don't mean to do that. But when talking about his dad made me think of it. Five months. It's crazy. Anything else? I'll close this out. Father, thank you. Uh, for allowing us to come here and uh, study your word. And I pray, Lord, that I didn't butcher it up too bad. I'll leave that to the Holy Spirit. That's not my job. I just uh, I th I thank you for everybody here and, and for the thirst that everybody has to, to drink more of, of the living water. And I just pray that you would increase that daily in all of us. Bless the next service. Uh, bless the service out at Kenwood, whoever's preaching out there. I just pray that uh, your, your presence will be felt 
and that the name of Jesus would be lifted up and glorified. And I pray that somebody will be set free today. I pray that somebody will get saved. I pray somebody will want to join with us here and join our church. And I pray somebody will want to come forward and be identified with you in baptism. I leave all of that at your feet, Lord. We just thank you for who you are and for loving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.